What I've been trying to do uh, is trying to pull together information from either uh, open source on the web or also from material from uh, that's been released by Edward Snowden. And so, uh, uh, and the point was that a lot of this material comes out into the news media in various bits and pieces, and, and people don't clearly understand what that really means or how it fits together. So what I was trying to do was to pull information from the web that I could see, and also slides from the, released by Edward Snowden into a, a presentation that would help people understand what's really happening to them. So um, this is what I want to go through here. So it's, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, it's how they're collecting information on everybody on the planet. It is anybody that uses anything electronically uh, or financial transactions, uh, phone calls, email, everything. Um, and this is how they're doing it. Um, and this slide simply sh shows how the kind of information they want to pull together on anybody just to track everybody, where they are, what they're doing, and really getting into what they're thinking. Uh, because if you assemble this kind of information on individuals in terms of what they're buying, where, where they're, what they're Googling, or what they're uh, saying, or what they're, uh, where they're moving, all of that kind of information, you can pull that back together and really start to see into their thinking process. And when you do this on a massive scale, you're looking at the entire planet and what the planet's thinking. This is how you begin to assemble information to be able to control people. Okay, so this is basically what, uh, what they're doing. So this is the kind of information, <clears throat> and they, they acquire it fundamentally. Uh, the bulk of it is done through the uh, fiber optic networks around the world because that's where the vast bulk of information is being transferred back and forth between people. Uh, and so I went on the web <clears throat> to try to look at points of interest in the fiber optic networks. All of this is documented on the, on the web. If you want to go find it, just uh, Google uh, any of these companies and their fiber lines. and then. They'll give you. They'll show you the, uh, the the layout of fibers that they manage around the world. So, uh, in in collecting information, you want to try to optimize uh, the the data that you're collecting. So, you look have to look at where these fiber lines converge, because at that point, if you put a collection device, you can see many fibers simultaneously, and you optimize your output for your collection device at that point. So, so the idea is to find where those lines converge. And that's where you want to put your collection dust. So when I went through these different, these are the only four that I looked at, but <clears throat> between AT&T, Verizon, British Telecom, and T-Mobile, these are the cities where they have at least three or more fiber lines converging. So that's an optimal point to put collection devices. <clears throat> because at that point, that picks up all the communications and all those lines. After all, if you send an email, uh, and you put multiple addresses on your email, it will go through the fiber lines in many directions. Uh, and uh, they'll pass through some of these switches, so the chances are that they will they will get virtually any, anything that anybody sends anywhere if they focus at these points. So this is basically inside the United States, uh, because 80% of the fiber lines if are inside the United States or pass through the United States. That means that uh, automatically, if you <clears throat> put all your collection devices in the United States per se, you get to see on, on uh, percentage-wise on the order of 80% of everything the world transmits. Because all those lines, either, that's, and it's no coincidence, by the way, that fiber lines run from South America up to Miami and Florida and then back down to South America. That's so that all the flow coming up and down. Even when they're sending light from Brazil to Argentina, it goes, goes up through Miami and comes back down. So they have, they have an 80% probability of getting that. So, uh, and there's more. Uh, these were other positions inside the United States. And of course, then it goes around the world. Most of the collection points would be in the US. But here are the ones in the rest of the world. Um, that is where three or more lines would converge just with these four companies. Uh, they're not limited to these four companies. So these are just the four uh, that are major ones for, uh, for us in the United States or in Britain and so on. So. So at, once you do that, then the idea is to, to uh, tap into the lines. And how do they do that? Well, <clears throat> there, are, there are three basic approaches they use. One, uh, it, the, first, uh, the first and obvious one to try to do is get the corporate uh, cooperation. That is, uh, get the companies that manage the fiber optic lines to cooperate with you. Of course, you pay them for it. You, know, you give them money, so it adds to their business bottom line. Um, and that's how you buy your way into it. So the, and then because once, once you put the fiber taps on and start collecting the material, the companies will manage it for you so it's not an overhead management problem for you that they have, they have uh, technicians to manage it. That's much like, uh, <clears throat> like what uh, 
Uh, Mark Klein, uh, when he talked about the AT&T facility and the fiber optic taps, the NSA, in the NSA room on the sixth floor, I think it was, or the AT&T building. Well, uh, that's, that's, that's the best way to do it because then AT&T manages all that, so NSA doesn't have to, once they have the initial payment to buy the room, set it up, and, and, and then just have a month, monthly or yearly payment going to AT&T just to get the data. Why well, AT and T then manages it because it's all the equipment they're familiar with, so you know, that makes it easy to do. And then the second way is if they don't have corporate cooperation, they can go to the local foreign government, uh, and/or the counterpart that they have, like NSA, could go to GCHQ or BND or NS, uh, N N FRA or NIS or DDI, DDI, DDIS. or so any any uh, similar kind of organization, signal organization in in a foreign land and have an agreement there and then get the government to come around and agree to it. This is how the intelligence community works together, okay? So uh, worldwide, it's not just in, in, in the five eyes, but. So uh, <clears throat> that then uh, is arranged either by second party or, or third party, that's defined. First party is US, second party is the other English speaking countries, Canada, UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and third party is everybody else. That's how they, classify countries and relationships. So, but if you go there and get their agreement, then they similarly get the local company to agree, you know, and they, that's how they leverage them and they then tap the line. And uh, the ultimate way is if you can't get the corporate companies or you can't get the uh, governments to agree, we'll do it unilaterally. That, that simply means, this is how they, they tapped into Google's lines between their major centers when they were transferring data back and forth. It was a unilateral tap. So that means they, anywhere they can have access to the fiber, they can go tap it without anybody knowing. Not the government or the corporation. So this is like, uh, <clears throat> if you want to uh, uh, find out some of the ways, you can you, uh, Google uh, USS Jimmy Carter. Uh, that's a submarine. So that's how you can get into uh, under, uh, under ocean taps or things of that nature. So the idea is you have to have a physical access, that's all. So anywhere the fiber, like like if you want to find out your fibers are tapped and you want to know if they did it unilaterally, you would have to trace the fiber lines all the way, through the ocean, under the oceans, everywhere. Okay, just to be sure you're not tapped. But these are the three ways that they, they do the tapping. So, uh, and these are the parties that I was talking about. Uh, first, uh, first party is of course US, second party is uh, the other English speaking, and third party is everybody else. These are the relationships they have. At least as they've been, uh, this is from the Snowden's material, so it at least lays out the countries that are property. Uh, the slides will be here if you want to get copies. I'm sure they'd be glad to give you copies. So, so then, uh, uh, <clears throat> this is one of the, the PRISM slide. The PRISM, PRISM made a, a, a lot of, uh, created a lot of interest over in my country because they were talking about going to the internet service providers and uh, various other service providers and doing a, getting information directly from them on US citizens and everybody else that the, those companies service. But the real, the real tap was on the, uh, the real information acquisition system is the upstream system. That's where all the fiber optic taps are. And it says right there, uh, collection of communications on fiber cables and infrastructure as data flows past. That means the fiber optic taps, okay? So that's where, the, that's how they're tapping into the system, the three ways I've talked before. Uh, and you see some of the names there, programs, Fairview, Stormbrew, Blarney, and Oakstar. Well, uh, those are only four. Okay, it doesn't mean they're all. But uh, Fairview is the one of interest here, and that's where they get the bulk of content as well as metadata. Now, they get that from PRISM too, but it's more of a requesting specific information on specific people from, from companies, whereas the upstream is collecting everybody. It's taking in the bulk acquisition. And in the case of Fairview, these are the fiber optic taps in the United States. This is domestic collection in the United States. Um, there's about 80 to 100 of these taps. These are all the points. And if you went back to the names of the cities we gave, you can see the cities there. That's for the internet. Uh, the internet taps, I believe, are the dark blue um, colored uh, uh, figures here that show you where they're tapping for the internet. And the others are the phone network like the uh, public switch telephone network where they record, digitally record the phone calls. That's how uh, 
Tim Clemente, a, for, a former FBI agent, could say on CNN television that after the bombing in Boston, that uh, they, they, they had ways and means of getting back to the communications, the phone call between one of the Tsarnaev brothers and his wife. Um, he said they had a way of getting back to that. Well, it's because they're tapping and recording the phones. So that it's indexed and available to them. Probably for a period of time, uh, my estimate was somewhere between 20 and 30 days. Because there's probably on the order of 3 billion phone calls made every day in the United States, and something like, you know, similarly, something like 12 billion around the world. So it's a, it's a lot to record. And so they have a, a window of recordings, I'm sure, to be able to get back to within a certain period of time. And as they add days, then they age off the older days. So, so that window keeps floating forward. So. But this is, uh, these are the taps that they're using. Uh, this is another slide from Snowden. Uh, you can tell by the classifications at the bottom. So. Uh, this is worldwide, what they do. Uh, it shows the satellite collection. And one of the main entries there is, uh, uh, if you see there on the ledger down there in the lower right, there look, that is a CNE, that's Computer Network Exploitation. That says over 50,000 implants in the worldwide network. What that means is, uh, uh, and Jacob Applebaum did a presentation at the 30C3 conference in Hamburg uh, where he, talked, he showed a slide where they were uh, intercepting a shipment of Cisco routers and the uh, NSA peer personnel were, were implanting hardware and software on those. They, they intercepted it in transit, okay, so that the Cisco didn't know they were doing it, nor did the receiver know it was intercepted in the, in the mail. So then they opened it up and put in hardware and software on that switch so that when they, it, it got to its destination, the unknowing recipient would, in, would put them in their system and in fact be infecting their system with these implants. And the implants could then mirror image these switches or servers that they had, which means they could take anything going through that switch or anything, um, either subsets of that information or all of it, and they can also use it in terms of uh, servers. When they implant them in the servers, they can drain the server, meaning take all the information that the server has over a period of time using the unused CPU on the system and draining it out as it, even when they're on the air or uh, even when they're transmitting or using that, that server. So, uh, but the rest of it is a bunch of other things like the third party liaison and uh, regional um, SCS, and uh, those are uh, basically uh, our uh, foreign positions in the world, uh, plus, of course, the satellite network. So these are all the different systems that acquire information. And you notice, of course, that the US is, is dark, is blank. There's nothing inside. So you know that this slide is not telling you everything, OK? Because just from the Fairview slide that we showed before, you saw 80 to 100 taps inside the United States. Well, similarly, you don't see anything in Australia or New Zealand and also Canada and, and England. But that's the, that's the five I see. That's the, they're the center of this uh, collection of information. So, but that, that fundamentally means that the, the uh, NSA owns the network, all of it. Uh, so if you looked at it, then they're looking basically at two systems for communication. One's the public switch telephone network, and the other is the internet. Well, the public switch telephone network is uh, the entire world is divided up by the ITU uh, uh, into, into a number scheme so that when you dial your number, right, uh, this, this is a part of the scheme that goes into it. So if you dial zero, 00 here to get an international switch, then the next number you dial will get you to a region of this world. One, if you hit one, you're going to the US or Canada, or two is, you know, Africa, three and four is north and south. South and, south and North Europe, and so on. So all the way around, this is the way the switches manage the, when you, when you make the phone call, all of the switches are managing it. So you're giving them information. The number tells the switches how to route your communications through the system. So that means that, and this is how uh, caller ID works, okay? Because caller ID sees the number it's coming from, and you know, it tells you what, is, what number is calling you. So, all this is the information that the switches need to route calls to and from. So uh, what that means is, Andrew, for example, when the director of NSA got up and said that during the, uh, just before the 9-11 uh, attack in, in the US that the uh, NSA couldn't tell 
that the phone calls were coming from San Diego going back to the Yemen facility uh, for Al Qaeda. Well, it was absolutely false, okay? Because the switches knew, and NSA would know, because they had the data too that they're seeing off their networks and the taps. So they have all the data too from. That was just a long ride, a right lie. And that was only an excuse because then they could claim that they didn't know, you know? So that, it, there was no way they didn't know. So then the, uh, the point is that if you're looking, in that case, for anything that's inside the United States, which, which they should have been, if something was calling a known Yemen facility for Al-Qaeda that was well that was well known, that facility had been watched for several years even before that. So if somebody uh, uh, with a one on the number was calling into, into the Yemen facility, you knew it was immediately in the U.S. So, I mean, you know, it wasn't difficult. So the switches know how this works. So, so should our people who are working there, right? Actually, they do, they just don't want to admit it. So, but anyway, that's, that's very simply how you can approach the public switch tech, well, telephone network, and the internet is a very similar thing, although it's not as, uh, it's not as uh, rigidly structured number-wise. We give out numbers in terms of IPs, uh, internet protocol versions four and six, which are different uh, numbering schemes. Uh, uh, you can see the number runs from 0 to uh, uh, 255, and then four numbers that running from 0 to 255, that's IPv4 numbering scheme that's block allocated by the IANA, uh, the ICANN, you know. And so these are all block numbers, just like a, the numbering scheme from, uh, for the public switch telephone network, except it's, it, the blocks are subdivided by the five areas here at the world. Like they'll take a block and divide it into five parts and spread it around the world. It's like, so, so it wouldn't mean that something starting with a one, two wouldn't, would be in a certain area. Only part of that block would be, you know, and the other part would be in different areas. So then another block, they do the same divisions. But then, and the same would be true with IPv6. But still, the numbering scheme, if you know the blocking, is the same, a very similar thing. Also, also I might add that every, every device on the network, including your cell phones, your computers, servers, switches, all have a MAC number, a machine access code, which allows the, it tells, us, tells the system where in the world you are. Even if you're moving, when, you, when you're roaming, your number gets uh, registered with the local area. So then it identifies you in that network worldwide. So that, knows, that gives the system how to route it to you. So that's how that works. So uh, then what they do is they do uh, what uh, is currently called graphing. Um, that means they take, they take a, a phone call or an email and use the metadata to uh, link people and people are communicating or people are transferring money or people are traveling or where you live or all kinds of relationships. And this linking process is how they build knowledge about the, the people in the world. And so, uh, I don't have a pointer here, but if you go from one of the one of these blocks, like uh, if this was a known terrorist, this would be uh, a, a relationship, a phone call to another person that isn't a known terrorist and someone who is. Uh, so this is how you would say A calls B, A calls C, A calls D, and so on. And you link that all through the world and all that metadata relationships, and you put it into a uh, a, a rapid response kind of interrogating pro program, which is fundamentally a B plus tree index if you uh, are familiar with coding. Uh, that, that makes it easy to get to real quick and also get answers back real quick so you can keep up with fiber optic rates and then keep your processing moving. So that, that's that fundamentally how that works. And then this is like seven billion people who would, would just continue, you know, as to how the connections would be of everybody in the world. And then you do this for every other means of communications and means of transaction. Uh, transactions for phone uh, or um, uh, financial transactions, stock transactions, everything you can think of, they could be linked in that way. Each would be a separate graph, but then you start mapping the graphs and you get the entire app. app. Every aspect of your life can be mapped in that way, and then it consolidated to put it back together. Uh, but in the process, if they wanted to do a focused anal analytic approach, it would be real easy. Instead of taking in everything and graphing everything, all they would have to do is put the, if you have a known bad guy, just put, the, put him and only the first contact from that bad guy that isn't known. All the data for those two will give you anything that you wanted for, for, for terrorism or for dope smuggling. 
everybody else in the world, uh, you don't want to take in their data because all that does is bury you, and that's effectively what they're doing. They're taking in massive amounts of data and burying themselves so they can't figure out what's happening or what's going to happen because they can't get through it. There's just too much data. And they don't have the programs to do it, although they're soliciting that with the uh, White House Big Data Initiative that they issued in early 2012, I think it was, asking uh, <clears throat> the industry to come up with algorithms that could go through big data sets to find out what's important for them to look at in there for, with their people, using their people, because people can't get through it. So they need programs to go through it and find out. That's why they didn't stop the Boston bomber, the Fort Hood shooter, or the underwear bomber, or the Times Square bomber, or because they had too much data. Uh, this is what I've been arguing with them from, from, for eons. Anyway, into the 90s I was doing this, because your people are you're taking in too much data, you're taking in stuff that isn't relevant. Why do you care what, what 4.5 billion people in the world are doing when they're not even relevant to anything that's, a, that's, a, that's a, you're supposed to be doing, like it's foreign intelligence for potential threats? That's what they're supposed to be doing. That's the charter of NSA. It's not to collect bulk acquisition. This I call NSA uh, is now I refer to as the new Stasi agency. Because the Stasi had, you know, uh, files on everybody. So this is what they're doing, pulling the files on everybody. And it's pointless. I mean, if they're wasting their time, it does build a very big empire. I mean, if you collect a lot of data, it takes a lot to manage that, you know? So, but the real user of that data is not NSA. Uh, but through, if you kept that and did the encryption, you could have all of these protections find out everything you wanted to do, um, everything, every objective that intelligence was supposed to, to do, you could achieve, if you, even if you encrypted that data and kept it that way until you showed probable cause against the individual. And then you could use a, a, a courts to justify that and do a decrypt and attack them that way. That would give privacy to everybody in the world. Uh, but instead of doing that, they opted for the bulk acquisition and, and um, they got rid of the encryption so that no one was protected. And so therefore, uh, now they have a, a big acquisition and a, and a big management problem. To, that's why they had to build Bluffdale, that big facility in Utah, a million square foot storage facility for uh, data. Um, and that's where all this stuff is going because they, they can't figure it out, but they're going to store it. Uh, with the understanding that somewhere down the line, someone will come up with an algorithm that will be able to go through it and give them the information that's important to look at. So we'll keep it all there stored until we come up with that algorithm, and then we'll apply it. Um, in the meantime, though, that what they'll do is they'll use it to, uh, to go after people for law enforcement. And uh, it, here's the way this encryption process would work. Um, if you simply set a set of criteria that said, okay, if, if, like these are the two guys that came in from... Kuala Lumpur at their terrorist conference over there. <laughs> and, and the Malaysian government informed us that they were on the way, by the way, before they left. Uh, and uh, these are the guys who called back to uh, the Yemen facility when they were in San Diego. Uh, so we should have had them from, for targets as, from the beginning. In fact, they should have been followed as soon as they got the airplane by the FBI. Because uh, we had all the data to do that. And that would have given us the rest of the network and it would have worked like this. As you made phone calls around uh, to other people, if they were in the U.S., uh, they would be encrypted um, until you had multiple factors to say, okay, now we can decrypt it and, and target it. Okay, so that was even, even protection to that point. Until once, once there, we have probable cause, they're, they're going to be attacked okay, with this system. But until then, they have privacy. Now, if you're outside the country, uh, yeah, and you're called by a terrorist on one, even the first time, you, you're immediately uh, taken in. That's not an issue. That's not legally an issue uh, for us in the United States. Nor is it a, it's a relative thing that, that, that laws for our country apply to the citizens of that country. You know, that's true here in Europe as well as the States, as well as Russia. That's, that's true everywhere. So when it comes to a foreigner contacting a terrorist, whether or not they're in the U.S., now we can target them without any trouble first time they make the call. And that's still legal. Man. And you want your country to do that anyway. Because if you have a known terrorist in your country calling somebody uh, outside the country, you want to know who that is. And you want to follow what they're saying so you can prevent it or intervene. Right? That's the whole point of it. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's satellite or a regular telephone. And you can see how these networks, end, or email, 
And, and this is how that network would have been reconstructed if they used a targeted approach. All of it would have been legal, and all of it would have been, uh, let me go back to that one. That one shows uh, the first call to the Hollywood uh, facility inside the United States. Well, okay, we encrypt that value. So you can't tell who it is until we have probable cause, at which time you, you automatically do a decrypt, and, uh, and then you start targeting them, and then you find out who they are. That's the way the building process for analysis would work in this system. Uh, this is, of course, not what they decided to do, <laughs> but you can see it, this is the, an idea of how that would work. That's all. And show you how you can have uh, uh, protection uh, from your identity all along until probable cause was shown, and that was a, a, an effective way to do it. And it would give them privacy not only to everybody in the United States, but everybody in the world. That's not the option they picked. They picked the bulk option. And the bulk option is, look, in this case, this is a, the PRISM slide that showed how PRISM inputs, including, this is including the uh, CIA and the FBI who have access through this data, uh, through this mechanism here. This is the way they put it. Um, these are the programs over here that, uh, that show, first of all, the metadata going over here, which, which is the indexing. And all the content data goes down here for, uh, this is for uh, the, the digital network, and then this is the phone network over here. So you can see the two, two networks, and that, that information down here is indexed back here to the metadata and the graphing and the relationships, the social networks that are built for everybody in the world. So this is how that data is indexed, so that when you pull out a community from the de metadata, you also have the index content of everything that's related to it that's been collected and stored. So that's how they can go in. Now the FBI can go in and say, uh, or the CIA, or, or others, around, others around the world through a program called XP Score. So can go in and pull this data out. And it means that uh, they, they pull all the associated transmissions of emails and the recorded phone calls, as well as transcribed phone calls, or financial data, or any of that. That comes out with that community that you first define in the metadata and the graph. So that's how that works. That's how it's all correlated. And, and uh, these are the programs that are doing that. And a prism, by the way, this is only the prism input. You can put the upstream in place of prism, or you can put the, uh, the echelon, or you can put any other collection system they have in place of any, uh, in place of prism here. It all feeds into the same, same databases. So uh, prism was only one of the inputs. So then they have a, uh, uh, this is a slide made by an engineer I can tell. <laughs> because he talks about, here is how you discover, see this is how you discover knowledge. It's, it's low at the top and high at the bottom. Well at the top is the different program and it's based on metadata of, of known, they say strong selectors, that means it's, it's metadata that applies to known targets. So that here, these known targets now, all, anything related to them is being pulled out and they call that low discovery. Well, really, that's high discovery. <laughs> but down here, then they talk about content selection from dictionary cache term. That's called dictionary select. Now that means that every analyst puts in his set of words that he wants to see, that looks through all the content that everybody's saying or talking about, and it pulls out all that content related to that. Well, I mean, that, 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 that means very, that, that means any word, like uh, for example, in DHS, one of the words they pe they publish their word list they're looking for, and one of the words they're looking for is pork. So if you if you send an email or a phone you have a phone call with your wife and uh, you're at work and you say, "How many let's have pork tonight for dinner?" Your phone call or email gets sucked in and gets dumped on the analyst to look at. Okay, and it's just like you're making a Google search using terms. Okay, it's no different than that. When you make that Google search. What do you do? You get hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of returns. Well, there's no possible, if you get that every day with every day's input, there is no possible way you can make it through that, all that data. That's why I say they're making themselves dysfunctional, because when they do that, that's, what you, that's the burden you put on your analysts to come up with an answer. And they're the ones that are on the line to do that, not the engineers. They're only there to get the data and dump it on you. Okay, that's really what this means. So, and, uh, <clears throat> this is Pinwheel, was the uh, 
was the major database within NSA where all this data is found, you know, is found and, and uh, Marina was another one, and, and then they talk X key score. Well, that's again looking through uh, all of this bulk data using terms and, and things like that. Instead of using the real high traffic, uh, or, or high, in the traffic thief where they have the strong selectors, that's where you get meaningful data. The rest of it is just dumping tons of material on people that's not relevant at all. So actually they have, in my view, the uh, low to high should be high to low. So, I mean, <clears throat> if you, this, is, this is also the way they justify needing a big budget, by the way. Because to get all this data, it takes a lot of money. I mean, for the, the 80 to 100 taps on the fiber network just in the United States, it probably cost them 10 to 100 million on every tap. And if you do that <clears throat> 80 to 100, that's a lot of money. And then run that around the rest of the world, that's even more money. Well, then you, once you acquire all this data, you go to store it somewhere. You have, well, if you don't have it, you have to point, pay uh, $2.2 billion to build something like Bluffdale. And then they have another 600,000 square foot facility they're building on Fort Meade in, in Maryland that they broke ground for last summer. So, I mean, it's a matter of having, uh, you, you have to build new storage, you have to build new communications, you have to build new tapping points, you have to build, and then you have to have all these contracts to manage it, and you have to have more, more people come in to, to guard it, and to, to keep all, everything protected, and then you have to hire more analysts. This is how you build an empire. This is how you go to Congress and say, I need more money. That's how you build a budget. That's exactly what their point was. It wasn't about solving the problem, it was about building an empire. And this now applies to everybody in the world since they're going all around the world with all these agreements. All these com countries are buying into this when in fact this is a total totalitarian process. Because it's destroying our democracy. This is, in my view, the greatest threat to our democracy in my country since our civil war. Oh, amen. And now it's, the, now it's infecting everybody else. And they're all, everybody's buying into this and it's a false premise buying. But now here's where they look at the relationship mapping within communities of, of, of social networks. For example, if this is your social network, that is at the top is your phone number that everybody else you call, and that's the timeline and your interactions over, over time, that, that gives you an idea of who you're communicating with and when. And then down at the bottom there, I see data in the lower right corner. If there's data that goes with that transaction in this timeline, then you can point to it, click on it, and read it. If, whether it's a transcribed phone call or an email or whatever. So that's, the data is there and available to look at to try to consolidate what your interactions are implying in your community. I mean, it's like if, if you're trying to smuggle drugs, you have to first find a buyer-seller connection that has to be connected, and then they have to contact the transporter and they have to make financial transactions to transfer the money, they have to transfer the drugs, you know, all the transactions that have to occur uh, to do that are represented here in the, in, the, in the interaction of people. And you just have to start figuring out what that pattern is, and then that from there on, once you discover that, you can then look at this community and tell exactly before they start doing it what they're doing and who they're involved, who's involved and where they're part of the center. That's how you can do these kinds of uh, predictions of smugglers or even militaries and governments. So at any rate, this is the this was the ultimate objective to do these kinds of timelines. So <clears throat> they're not looking at these uh, unless you're a target. If you're a target, this is what they're looking at. Uh, but all the data to do this is available and stored on you. That's the whole point. That, that this bulk acquisition pulls this kind of data together or stores it for everybody. And if you become of interest at a certain time, then then like you may say, um, I'm not doing anything, so I have nothing to fear, right? Good quote from Joseph Goebbels, as I said before, but also it's totally irrelevant what you think. What you think doesn't matter. What, is, what the state thinks is what matters. If the state thinks you're doing something that they don't want you to do, you're a target. Doesn't matter what you think. So, at any rate, are you good? yes. Is this a screenshot of a program? Of a yes, it is, yeah. It, it was our equivalent program that we were doing internally in NSA. We were making a commercial product. This is the display from that commercial product. Uh, so this is for sale for general public? Not now, no. We were raided and stopped <laughs> okay, by the FBI. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> they, didn't, they didn't want this out, so. Okay. Uh, I would like to have your slides. 
uh, you know, I'll have co they'll have copies soon. Yeah. So at any rate, that's, uh, and then what I get at was uh, uh, what the main user of this data, the bulk acquisition data, is law enforcement. And they're going in, like the FBI showed on that one slide, going into those databases. They're looking for uh, criminal activity. And if they know who you are, they have a way of getting back to everything you did. Okay, and so the, the rules are this. The, the, this was, um, it, this says, uh, you can't see here, but it says law enforcement sensitive. That's the law enforcement classification system. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, this is the Special Operations Division of the, uh, the Drug Enforcement, uh, it's not the agency administration of this. But uh, the uh, Special Operations Division is set up to look into the NSA collected data. Okay, looking specifically for criminal activity. So then these are the rules that govern that. Uh, this is policy of the Department of Justice of the United States. Okay, and it shows that uh, using this, you can't reveal it, uh, e either in your reports or your affidavits to the court, or, or you can't even tell the attorneys, uh, or anybody in the court proceedings, and you can't even tell the state and local police forces that go arrest these people the source of the data, or this, the data, per period. And, and most importantly for you all here, I think, is you can't tell your foreign counterparts, which means the equivalent policing agencies here in, uh, in Belgium, Netherlands, everywhere in Europe. Anybody who's cooperating with the FBI or the DEA, they can get this information. And so what they have to do is called a parallel construction. What this means is they have to use... Uh, they go back and use uh, uh, typical policing operations to try to find the information that would show probable cause to justify an arrest so that they can substitute that information for the NSA information in the court of law. <coughs> okay, now that's, and these are, the, these are the kinds of things like the, they, <coughs> you, you, they would go through to do this parallel construction. But what it means fundamentally is uh, they're perjuring themselves in court. So I call this... Uh, a planned program perjury policy run by the justice chief, the, by the attorney general of the Department of Justice of the United States. So, and they've been doing this since 9/11. This is not new. This is over 10 years. And one of this was reported by Reuters last August uh, in in, uh, in my country. At least that's when I saw it. And uh, one of their interviews with one of the federal agents that was involved in running this program. Uh, commented to him, he said, "This is such a great program. I just think we can keep. We, I just hope we can keep it secret." Well, this entire program uh, of collecting data has been kept secret from the American public from the very beginning, and that's been so because this has been unconstitutional all along. Uh, and and they they deliberately kept it even from even from Congress. There were only originally there were only four people in Congress who were briefed into this collection of data. When was the beginning? Uh, it actually started in October of 2001, uh, because up to that point they didn't have the way to uh, to collect the data on the fi at fiber optic rates. Uh, we we originally produced that in my little SARC signal operate sig signals uh, signal uh, automation research center. We we developed the ability to process the fiber optic rates sessionized, what we call. They'll all reassemble all the packets of fiber optic rays, and, and the, so you can see your email. Instead of seeing it package, you get the whole thing presented to you, or the same for anything, kind of picture, or anything that went across the internet. We did that in 1998. Um, and after that, uh, we were in competition with another program that uh, Hayden uh, had, was, was uh, advocating, and so we, they didn't take advantage of that until after 9-11. But at that point, they, they had now the ability to collect all this data that they could, uh, and they removed all the filters up front because we filtered everything out before it, before it was never ingested and stored anywhere because we filtered it out based on the graphing uh, principles and the known, the known targets and zones of suspicion around them. That was what we were looking at. That's the only thing we took out in terms of content. The rest of it, we just let go by. And we did that filtering up front. That's one of the first things they took off. They took that filtering off so they could take in all the data and store it. And the second thing they removed were the encrypted encryption processes that protected you after even even if you got ingested <clears throat> and stored in the network uh, into the databases. Uh, that is, they removed all protection, so you had no privacy at that point either. So everything at that point you, was well known. It was known on everybody because they were taking everybody and everything that was on the launch. 
but, but this is not only, this is subverting our judicial system in the United States, and it's also subverting uh, judicial systems around the world, because this is information being held secret from the courts, and then it's being used indirectly and falsely uh, under, under perjured testimony to, um, to convict people around the world. And my, I guess my point is that it may, it may be, you may say, well, all these people really deserve this because they're doing something bad. But to me, democracy, it, it's not, the ends don't justify the means. Democracy is all about the means. It's not about the ends, it's about the means. It's giving privilege and, and, uh, and rights to humanity. That's the means. So that's what that means to me. I think. Uh, that's the last one. So that's the that's the that's the real use of all this data is in policing. Uh, but it has, of course, with all this information available on everybody, it has a lot to do with targeting also. But you have the ability to target the, the Tea Party politically or anybody else you want. Uh, indirectly, I think all of it. Directly, it's only the FBI and the SOD and the, the DEA, or the SOD within the DEA. There are regional areas where the FBI is involved in little pockets of uh, analysis that get into this data. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly where they are, but uh, they, they have different uh, coordinating centers or consolidating centers of information that they use that, that involves NSA, CIA, D, DHS, the uh, of course, uh, the SOD and uh, Department of Homeland Security. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. And, uh, and also the IRS is a part of this. Fusion yeah. Center. Yeah, Fusion Center. Fusion that's Center. It. Yeah, that's right. that, and the IRS is a part of it. That's how the IRS knows all, your, all the relationships of anybody who wants to get 501c3. They know that from all the graphic. That's how they can ask and they target people that way, too. Darknets. It's a parallel system from the internet. Yeah, well, I think that that's probably being used by them to forward the data back. I mean, we used to call that the dark fiber network, right? Darknets, there's no identity. You can get communications within persons, within groups, but without giving your identity. Uh, I uh, really don't know where that can be true, because uh, uh, the system has to be able to forward it to you in some way. The data has to be there to get you something, information to you, and it has to get it from people wherever they are. They have to know where it goes or have a, have a way back to them, so to ensure at least tell them that their message got through. I mean, the whole system is set up to verify that the process works. So I don't know how that, I mean, maybe it's not a, a well-known procedure, but I'm sure that they have ways of getting that. Yeah. Do the NSA approve targeting people who are highly intelligent, like for example, in my family, we have almost 10 graduates in different, different fields. In law, biophysics, biochemistry, and master degree holders, in all my family members. Do NSA approve targeting intellectual people? Uh, I would say that uh, if, if your uh, family members of your family are doing something different than it, don't you target it. I mean, uh, otherwise, you're just you're taken in with the mass of everybody else. All that data is taken in and stored. But targeting means to them uh, somebody's going to look at that data. Uh, people are going to start looking and examining the information about you. That means targeting. Uh, whereas everybody else is simply stored, right? All the data that is stored, it's not you're not targeted until people start looking at the data. But uh, uh, does it mean uh, everybody is uh, listening? Can we leave the questions for the end of the session? Can we go to the last session? Okay. Last right. <laughs> Well, my one important question: one Do you know how all this is linked to mind control? Uh, no, I, I, I really don't. 
I really don't, but it, it certainly builds a foundation of information to do targeting of people. Uh, and that's probably you know, just as dangerous I mean, to set it up that way. And then they could have their reasons for targeting individuals. Now, how that fits, I don't know. <laughs>